I'm excited on today. Thank you, brothers. I appreciate it. I'm excited on today. We have a wonderful opportunity um, to, to really do ministry, and we're going to ask for your grace a little bit, but to really um, kind of really lean into the day and lean into the experience. Um, Pastor Ken, uh, my father, can we give some love for Pastor Ken in his absence on today? Um, uh, my father, Pastor Ken, started this ministry um, 21 years ago. Our foundational scripture is Isaiah 58, 12. It says, for some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities, and then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. So everything we do in this ministry is about rebuilding, restoring, looking at things through the eyes of God, not through the eyes of man. And so over the next few minutes for the rest of this service, you're going to hear from men who really have adopted that whole approach that has been in this ministry since its inception. So I want to call some brothers out who's going to be doing ministry with me on this morning. The first person that I want to call up is Mr. Christopher Mamou. If you could join me on the stage, we can give him some love on his way up. Chris serves as an armor bearer and many other things here in our ministry. I also want to call up Pastor Michael Davis, our one and only executive pastor. We give him some love. And I want to call up Elder Earl LeBlanc, Elder Earl, Elder Earl. He's been an elder in our ministry and been a part of this ministry. And um, we have the wonderful opportunity to come before you. So first person that I want to turn the mic over to is Chris, who's going to share a couple things. Please sit down. Don't get, get up for me. Don't get up. Don't get up. <laughs> all right. So, men, listen. I know we all we will actually uh, acknowledge you all, but y'all better make the most out of this because y'all got to wait another year before it's y'all time. Well, they can't tell y'all nothing. So, again, happy Father's Day for everyone. Give, can we give men a round of applause again? Well, I have the honor of actually um, coming before you all and speaking about our uh, father of the house, uh, Pastor Ken Lazard. That's where y'all clap at. You think about um, Pastor Ken and you think about everything that he, he does and is trying to figure out how do you actually give a tribute to someone who does so much and in a conversation I was having with my wife, we were just talking, and she told me something that, that kind of sparked. She says, the benefit you get out of a relationship is actually a reflection of the extent of how you know a person. Now, ponder on that. The extent of how you know a person. See, Pastor Ken wears a lot of different hats. I mean, we know he's a father. He, um... He has three sons. I mean, matter of fact, we know them all, right? We can name them all, right? Right? All right, let's actually try it from the oldest to the youngest. The oldest is? Second. And the youngest is? Yeah, so we all know him as a father, right? Well, the reason for this, uh, this tribute is actually is biblical. It actually says that in 1 Timothy uh, 5, 17, the pastors who lead the church well. The pastors who lead the church well. The pastors who lead the church well should be paid well. They should receive double honor for their faithfulness, preaching and teaching the revelation of the word of God. Does that sound like Pastor Ken? So the thing that 
that I wanted to share, because see, it's like a gift. He's actually really been a gift to so many of us, but you know, the gift is only as good as the person who receives it, right? And how they actually receive it. But you can only really receive the true gift if you understand how to work it, right? If you got a big screen TV, 72 inches, and you don't know how to turn it on, it, it ain't doing you no good. You agree? So with that, I want to share something. Have you ever had, have you ever had an experience, and we talk about in this, um, the complete totality of who he is, because have you ever had a situation where you spoke with someone or you had a different uh, opinion of someone other than like with someone else, like you and somebody else have a totally different outlook on a different person, and you say that's not the person that I know, right? It's kind of crazy because we all know there's one God, right? But when you actually, it's all depend on your experience. So if you have God and God is actually in your life, he showed up as a healer, you're going to call him Jehovah Rapha. If he showed up in the times when you're depressed and your mind is cloudy and, and things are just not going right, and he gave you peace, you know him as Jehovah Shalom, right? So if you found him to come and provide for you when those times where you didn't know where it was going to do, you're going to call him Jehovah Jireh. So God has different attributes, correct? And in Genesis, it says that, Genesis 1.26 says, let's make man in our image. So that means we have different attributes, right? And that's why I stand before you, because I want to share some of the attributes of, a, of the father of the house, Pastor Ken. See, as we say, we, we know he's as a, he has kids. We know he's a father. He know, we know that somehow back in the 90s, he was watching this movie, The Preacher's Wife, and he heard a call. And he went to ministry school. That's the reason why I never watched this movie since. <laughs> the question is, what makes a father a father, right? It says, I asked Google, you know, Siri knows everything, right? So I just want to see what they had to say. I told you I needed my theme music. That would have set it off. <laughs> it's about being consistently available for our kids through good times and bad, being personally engaged in our kids' lives, interests, hopes, and dreams on a daily basis. Being curious and attentive requires us to put our distractions to one side, showing compassion, hope, belief, when our kids need us the most. That's what a father is, right? So then I actually search and I say, well, what's a pastor? It says someone who has the authority to lead religious services Pastors leave church service to help others in worship. Now, that's actually what pastor is, just a pastor, right? But we got something different. We got a working pastor. We got a pastor that makes sure that everything is actually taken care of before you get here. This is the same pastor that you can see with pictures. He got, he's on a lawnmower cutting the grass. He's cutting the grass so when you pull up in the parking lot, it doesn't take away from your experience inside the church. So you're not distracted by looking at all those weeds. Them people know they can do something better than that. They can cut the grass. He takes it upon himself to make sure that that's done. We talk about going out of the, the, the four walls of the church. Pastor actually goes past the four blocks picking up trash. Why? Because he's actually intent on making the impact for all of us. He, goes, he does all this here for us. So we have the opportunity to go ahead and be led into a place of worship without any distractions. That's what our pastor is. Now, he does something else for a few others who have the opportunity to experience him as a, a spiritual father. Now, I hope y'all know it's a difference between a pastor and a spiritual father. Oh, y'all don't? Okay, let me tell you what, what Siri said. A spiritual father is someone who cares for us, who impart us love, who helps us with our identity, our spiritual covering, and prays for us, and is concerned about our well-being. That sound like Pastor Ken? Okay, well, that's where y'all supposed to clap again. I got to get y'all these cues, huh? Now, here's where it comes back. In return, we are to love 
honor, serve, care. We also give in return to make our spiritual father work easy and receive covering from them and grace and the blessing of Christ. In order for there to be a spiritual father, it's going to cost you something for you to have a spiritual father. It's going to cost you to, cost you to enter your heart posture of submit. You have to place your heart in a posture where you're willing to become a spiritual son or daughter. Now, though this actually costs and it's going to hurt a little bit because it's going to fight your natural will. You're going to have to give up the right to be right all the time. You're going to have to be okay with being rebuked sometimes. You're going to have to be willing to get, let people get inside a little bit closer to you. Because when you get into the spiritual father, spiritual sonship relationship, it's a little bit more intimate than just being a pastor and, a, and a, uh, someone who comes to church. See, but the sonship that I actually have with Pastor Ken, it, it grants me access to certain things. I don't have to wait till every Sunday for a question or for counsel, for guidance. I don't have to wait till there's actually a, a, a hurricane outside where the, um, of problems where he calls. Recently, this first part of the year has actually really been... Um, uh, uh oh, there it goes. Woof, shake it off. All right, this this beginning of the year was a real tough one um, for me. I found myself with a, a health challenge, and I remember going through the operation and coming out. And the first thing I saw when I looked over to the right was Pastor Ken, dressed in all white. Now I was kind of kind of confused because I was still on that good stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> But I looked at him twice because I see I didn't remember I can't remember a lot of stuff that happened in the hospital, but I remember that, and I remember him actually praying over me. I remember him um, talking to him. I remember him encouraging me, and I remember when I even when I came home, you know, it was a really, really, really. It was a real dark time for me, you know, because I was trying to understand, trying to process like. Why did it happen to me? And Pastor Kim was there every step of the way. He encouraged me, checked up on me daily, gave me words of encouragement, gave me books to read, songs to hear, listen to, um, sermons to watch, just so, he, just so I can actually push through. And it, and it was because of our relationship. And I'm appreciative to him. I'm a very much appreciative to him because he helped my transition from point A to point B from getting out of the darkness because I would tell you I was dark. I'm going to tell you it was actually really, I wanted to give up. <sighs> but God. <laughs> See, God used Pastor Ken because, you know, first, I'm going to be honest with all y'all. Not just anybody could talk to me. Because I'm not going to listen just to anybody. You know, you got to be able to, you can't give me some super fluff stuff. No, I need the real. I need stuff that's actually direct and right to me. Tell me, you know what, just tell me what it is. And tell me why this is. And Pastor Ken did just that because he knows me. He knows me. He said, the word says that the sheep knows my voice. And I'm his sheep. He actually is the one, he's my shepherd. He actually goes and he uh, and led me to this point. So I'm forever grateful for him. I thank him for giving me an example of what a father should be. I thank him for actually um, giving me, I'm thanking God for giving me a pastor that, that I could follow. I'm thankful for actually having a spiritual father to guide me in those situations when I need him the most, to actually cover me, to actually uh, encourage me and exhort me. I appreciate Pastor Ken uh, immensely for all that he's actually done for me. And if y'all don't mind, I'd like for y'all just to one time, just give Pastor Ken a round of applause. <laughs> See, the things that I have with Pastor Ken, you can have it too, again, 
it's available to you all. You just have to make a decision that you're willing to submit your will and to come underneath the covering of him as a spiritual father. He has a class uh, outside, Pastor Alex spoke of, uh, servant leadership. That's a great step to start up because as he said, his greatest uh, role model was Jesus Christ. He came to serve and not to be served and that's what Pastor Ken exemplifies. Thank y'all. Well, good morning to you again. Uh, happy Father's Day to the men. Um, as we honor Pastor Ken, I want to piggyback off what Chris said before we get into the teaching on this morning. Um, you know, the Bible, the word tells us that you have many instructors, many people who give you instructions, but you don't have many fathers. Let me say it again. You have many people that instruct you, they tell you things. But when it's time to be there for you, when it's time to be there nurturing that uh, intimacy, uh, someone that sits close to you, someone that guides you, someone that's really concerned about your everyday life, the Bible said that you don't have many of those. So naturally, we see that this society has a lack of fathers present. In a matter of the race, white, black, it doesn't matter. It's not just an issue in the black community but there's a lack of fathers. And in the church of God, there, there are lack of fathers. And so when you have fathers that want to be there, that's concerned about you and not concerned about them, you know, how many people you know that this is, what, what can I get out of this? How much can I make? What kind of car can I drive? What, how can I live on a certain lifestyle? But when you have a pastor that, whose heart is really that of a shepherd, of a father who's more concerned about you than them, then that means that you have to understand and value what you have. You see, it's about your perception. How are you receiving the gift that God has placed in this ministry? And so one thing that I have learned over, over my Christian life is to honor and respect and to support with my time, my effort, and my money, our pastors. And so I want to encourage you on this time right now, because I'm going to give you an opportunity to be a blessing to our spiritual father. And so there's going to be some porters in the aisle. Uh, find a gift to give to Pastor Ken. Uh, he's not here today, but we're going to give it to him when he comes back. Um, sow a seed into his life. If you're writing a check or uh, putting cash in an envelope, um, you select uh, pastors there. If you're giving electronically through the Church Center app, just select Pastor's Gift. So whether you're online or in a sanctuary, I want to give you this opportunity to be a blessing to the gift that God has given this church. I'm going to say it again. We're going to give you an opportunity to honor the gift that God has given this ministry. So at this time, if we have any porters in the church, let's go ahead and pass our envelopes as we give to the support of our pastors. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So as we go ahead and um, transition to this next um, form of worship, which is going to be the Word of God, we're going to call up Elder Earl, who's going to be first to speak to, and no clap prime time, to our prime time people. Amen? Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Pastor. Prime time. Amen, amen. Good morning, family. Uh, I just want to, before I start, I just want to give honor to, it, 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 it's an honor to be a father. And I know you guys that are here, it's, it's, it's a blessing. And the job that fathers do is not scripted, right? You make it up as you go. And then you make all those mistakes, and then you step back and say, oh, that was wrong. Let me figure something else out. Or your family says, that's not the way you manage. So before, we go, before I go into what I want to talk about, I want to give honor to the one person that allowed me 
to be a father, and that's my wife, Donna. Without Donna, without her love, without her love, I probably wouldn't be standing here. So I want to talk today about, wait, oh, these guys had laptops. I'm prime time. That's how we roll. That's how we roll. All right, because I, I, I can't remember everything. I can't flip the scroll and everything. They'll tell you. But I want to really talk about, my, what I want to talk about today is the father of a legacy generation. And when we talk about a legacy, that's what we want to leave behind as a father. According to God's will, according to God's call, according to the blessings that we've had, we have in our life that God put us in a position to be a father. Okay? And to start this off, and I would ask you to bear with me, I want to honor my father, my dad, who I lost 52 years ago. And the short time that he was with us as a family, I realized, and, and my family will tell you, this wasn't a good weekend for me. I don't know why, but 52 years of losing or missing my dad, it just sunk into me this week. I didn't want to do anything for today. I just found myself moping. Man, I don't feel like, I, don't, I wasn't into it. So, but, but where's Neil? Neil's here when I heard faithful, God is always faithful. And that's the thing that I had to wake up and shake up to realize that through 52 years of not having my father, God was always faithful. So I want to say my role as a father, and I have to write it down because they only gave me a certain amount of time. My role as a father goes back to my dad who God only allowed in my life for 13 years. He died of cancer. In that time, to me, he was a trainer. He trained me to be disciplined. He trained me to master my skills. He trained me to work to be better and understand how to reach my best. He was always, give, you can give your best. And I look at the trainer, he had to train me. And then once he trained me, he was my coach. To know how to motivate, correct, and what to learn or understand what a leader needs to execute a plan of success. Now, fathers, think about, while I'm calling through this, think about your role in a family. Are you training your children? Are you training your family to, to be able to understand what's, what they're going to face and how they're going to be the best? Are you coaching them through those tough, tough times? Are you coaching them through those processes where I'm doing the best I can, but he was also a player. And what I mean by that is he was actively participating. He engaged. He engaged in my life from birth to 13. He was always participating, engaging, contributing to the family. And I say this beyond. We had a great neighborhood. I lived in New Orleans. And my little neighborhood, that little corner space, we had about 15 kids that we went to school together. We went outside and played after. My dad packed kids 10, 9 at a time with a big Oldsmobile Delta 88, packed as many as he could into the car, drove to the lakefront, came back and got the other crew till we had about 15 or 18 kids out there. He was teaching us baseball and football. Everything he taught in that neighborhood, and there were some dads that were dads, but they weren't actively engaged in their kids' lives. He filled in, he stepped in. So he participated. When he knew he only had less than a year to live, he built a garage with a gym, paid the house off, and put money away for my mom and our my brother and I's education. My yard, it was a two-car garage, basketball goal on the, on the end, pool table, ping pong table, uh, a, above ground pool, so you, and a lot next door. So you know what my yard looked like at, after school. All of my friends would come over, and he would sit there and just watch us play. But he was engaged. He was a fan to enjoy seeing the success of his favorite family team. He would sit outside, watch us play sports with my friends in, in a distance, and I could hear him cheering. So are we fans to our kids? Are we fans? Are we coaches? Are we trainers to our kids? We're helping them to get to where we see in them. We know what they can be. But it takes that father's vision, that insight with prayer to lead them and guide them where their gifts that God gave them need to get to. He did his part. And I know that I was loved. 
I felt the love of my father. He knew he was going to die. He died of lung cancer, two packs a day. And at 13, when he died, I was empty. I couldn't tell you what, ha what my life was at 14 or 15, total blank. But I knew that he was there for me in those 13 years and continued to walk me through who I am today because of the memory, because of everything that I remember that he taught me. So when I look at, four, oh, by the way, uh, he had a 38-inch <laughs> waist and he had a 42-inch belt. I learned. I learned. But it was discipline. It was controlled. I got it, but it was discipline. Okay? I knew that he loved me. I knew that he loved me, and I knew that my dad was the model for the rest of my life. So I start thinking about father. What's a father? F-A-T-H-E-R. I love acronyms. So the F, the F is for faithful. Faithful to serve God and family. Faithful to be there when family needs you. Faithful to be loyal to your commitment to your family. As a father, are we faithful? Are we making that commitment to our family? And I'm not saying right or wrong. It's just as a father, we are charged to show up, to be present, to be what our family needs us to be. The A, accountability to God for what he has charged me to do in my life to family for leadership and being there in all seasons. As I said, we, I had a bad week, just totally bad work and just thinking about today because of the memory. But we still have to show up. We still have to be present when we're weathering our own storms. And sometimes we gotta look at our family and say, everything's great. And then go in that room and say, oh Lord, how are you gonna get me through this day? But we have to show up. To teach my family from my experiences, good and bad. Sometimes we don't want to tell them about the bad that we've experienced or the bad situations or the tough times we had, but that's those learning moments. Because when a, when a kid, a child, a wife, a parent can see you in your hard times and see you make it through there with the perseverance, the prayer, and knowing that you're accountable, they understand you're giving them a model. The T, trustworthy, standing on God's promises with the belief that he will do what he said he will. How many times have you called on God as a father, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, how do I get through this? Lord, what do I tell my child? What do I tell my wife? What do I tell my grandkid? And God makes a way. Amen? Your word is dependable, when we talk about trustworthy, your word is dependable and can weather trials or doubt. When do we not be dependable for our families? Sometimes when we're going through stuff, but we have to see that our dependability, they count on. We have to be there. We have to be present. To teach my family from my, well, I said that one already, to be the keeper of your family's fears and hurts close to your heart without judgment and keep them in your prayers. When a kid or someone confides in you, or when someone in your family talks to you, is being able to keep it in your heart, being able to know that, God, I got, a, I, got a, I got an issue here, God. This is what we're dealing with. And a lot of times, trust for, for a father is the glue in the foundation of a family. The H, humble, a listener that hears his spirit first and understands with humility of his mistakes. Being able to be humble. How hard is it as a man to be humble? We're meant to be lions. We're meant to defend our family. But sometimes just being humble shows greater power than our strength. Humble to receive feedback from family on shortcomings and with pride lurks in your heart. That's a tough one. How many times does pride step in the way of listening? How many times does, I'm a man, you can't tell me what to do? I don't, not that I say that. But sometimes our pride, we lose what the word or the message or what God is trying to show us because we, oh man. Honesty when you know and when you don't know. Being humble, I, I don't have the answer, I don't know. 
but I'll pray about it. I'll ask God about it. The E, encouragement, encourager, to provide wisdom and knowledge and support when others feel defeated. How many times does your child or someone have come to you and it's like, I don't know what to do? And you share that wisdom. And that's what I think from a, from a prime time, we've accumulated a whole pocket full of wisdom. How it worked, how it didn't work. And I think God has blessed us with the insight to share and to minister to people, minister to family because of that wisdom, because of that longevity of wisdom. Encourage you to offer empathy and speak of God's word that gives direction and hope. Seek ye first the kingdom. Seek God's word first so that the words that come from your spirit will come from God's heart, from God's heart to your spirit to talking and helping to direct your kids. To be the coach, motivator, biggest fan for your kids to gain confidence. That to me is, is a very strong gift. And I'll share and I'll, I'm going to put my daughter Christina, my first daughter, uh, my first child. Long time ago we used to, I lived in the walls, we used to coach and we were coaching, I was coaching softball, girls softball. And we, we had a good team but my pitcher was struggling at the end. We had, we, all we needed was two outs and the game was over, we won. And she was nervous, she was struggling. So I called a timeout. And Christina was playing outfield, I brought her in, I said, Tina, I need you to pitch. Dad, I can't do it, I can't do it. I said, please, I just need you to just get the ball over the plate. We got a good team, just get the ball over the plate. And she got up there, she looked at me, and was like, why are you making me do this? And I said, Tina, you're the only one I could yell at. I can't yell at the other girls, I could yell at you. And she pitched, we got them out, and we won the championship. But as coach, as motivator of your children, and nieces, nephews, whoever you have under your umbrella, we have to be that motivator. We have to be that one that directs them and guides them. The R, respect, accept and treat your older children as adults with their own ideas, goals, and ways of doing things without a closed mind. How many, how many fathers here you have children over 21, 18 to 20, up to 21 and over? They're adults. And sometimes we want to lock into, that's my baby, that's my little kid. They're adults and we have to respect that they have adult thoughts, adult life. And we have to take a step back. We can't get, we don't get out of the way, but we give them the space to be adults. And hopefully we built the foundation so that they can come, Dad, what about this? What about that? But we don't have to tell them what to do. We can guide them to what we feel is the safest, godliest approach to what they're dealing with. Actually listen to feedback from your family on your shortcomings. Listening is an art. <laughs> and we're all not artists. But being able to listen. If we say we're going to come into church and we're going to come in our, in our closet and we're going to pray and ask God for a word, what do we have to do? we got to listen. Same applies in the natural. is being able to be a listener. Receive spiritual learning from your family and spiritual leaders as God leads them to share wisdom with you. Just as God gives us wisdom, we have to be able to listen. We have to be able to receive spiritual learning. We have to be able to receive God's word. We didn't write the blueprint on being a father, but we have the blueprint in the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, as a man, when we repent of our sins and accept Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. The Spirit of God resides in us. We accepted Christ. Christ guides us. Christ, God follows our path that we try to take, and he just turns and says, nope, I need you this way. Go this. You were going that way. Turn. In Isaiah 11, verses 2 and 3, it says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decides by what he hears with his ears. Now, God was talking about Jesus Christ. But what, who lives inside of us? Christ. And so that spirit is inside of us. We use the wisdom, the insight of God to direct us to what he needs us to do as men, as fathers. So God's word is our promise. 
is a prime time father, prime time? And grandfather, in the Bible it says Abraham was the father of many nations. And I look at it in my perspective of every one of my children, and has, I, I have three grandchildren. And so every time our kid or our, our child becomes an adult and has a family, that's another nation and another nation, and a legacy continues and continues. So just as Abraham was a father of many nations, we as fathers become fathers of many nations. But we get that blessing of being a grandfather. And it's like, I look at that as a, it's kind of a, a do-over. God let, allow us to be born again again. Because every we, mistake we made as a father, we get a do-over with the grandkids. And the grandkids want to come to the house. Oh, Papa, I want to come by you. And they spend time with you, and then it's like, okay, now it's time to go home. Okay, yeah, oh, it's great. We had a great time. All right. Come get them. But as, pri <laughs> but as prime time, our legacy to our children is to be genuine examples or models of a godly father that they can compare when faced with decisions or choosing a father figure they want to be or see in someone else. Just as the young ladies want to get married and want to be able to, to start a family, being able to just look at any guy and say, well, he look good, but knowing the characteristics, knowing the character of a person. So young men, if you're out there and you're not married yet and want to be a father, be the father that God created. Be the prepared father that God created before you have kids because once you do, you're, you're, on, you're on live. And it's no saying, well, I didn't realize this. I didn't, I didn't know what to think about. I, 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 I. You are now a parent. You are now a father. I could not be the dad, papa, father, husband, and friend without my children's love. My wife's honest feedback and appreciation of who I am, flaws and all. And I look at all the things I've experienced in the family. We've been married 41 years. Thank you. And I can honestly say, flaws and all, she's still standing with me. I thank God for that. But it was learning how to be a dad, learning how to be a father, and now learning how to be a grandfather. In Proverbs 6, 22, and I'm closing, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And one of the things that I realize, and, and what I do now in, in some programs in the community with youth, the father's gone. The dad's not in the house. And mom is trying to take on that role. Grandmother is trying to take on that role. And so we have to go out and, and help young men who have become parents to understand what a father really is. I was sharing with one of the brothers at the brunch this morning. We, do a, we had a program that we're doing with the court system. And as soon as that program was over, we lost two kids to stealing a truck, and gun violence. And one of the kids told us, he said, we asked before that, he, we would say, well, what's going on with you? He said, I lost the voice. It's like, what do you mean? He said, my grandmother would always tell me what to do right and what not to do wrong. And when she died, I lost, my, I lost that voice. And next thing you know, he was just hanging out with the wrong people, and it ultimately cost him his life. We have to, as men, as fathers, we have to be that voice. We have to be that coach, that trainer, that motivator. For me, the best feeling in the world, after knowing that my family is under the blood of Jesus, is to hold back tears, and I cry a lot, when thinking about how great of a blessing it is to be their dad. Because once you become a father and a grandfather, now you get that title, which really is personal, of dad. D-A-D. Dad's dependable. Dad's awesome. Dad's dorky. You can make mistakes. You can do silly, stupid things. And it's like, oh, that's just dad. That's dad. So in closing, God left us a legacy in Jesus Christ. It's our time to leave our legacy with our family. Remember what God said, the greatest gift of all is love. And I think that's the thing that blesses me the most, is knowing that I have a family that loves me despite me, and it just makes me love them even more. And, and I, as I said, 52 years of losing my dad, but every day I, I wonder, what if he was here? Am I doing okay? 
would I have been a good example of what a father really meant? And I thank God that our father found me to make sure that my spirit lives on, just like I feel is my dad's spirit, and Jesus' spirit lives on in our, all of our lives. So fathers out here, I commend you, and I guess I, I kind of charge you to go out and engage. Engage in your family, engage in every young person you can, and realize that there's some people that are not privileged to be called to be fathers, but be a father for that person that really needs you. Thank you and God bless. Amen. Well, I'm going to speak to you from a next level perspective. This is going to apply to everybody in here, of course. But <laughs> really speaking about fathering with humility is really what I'm talking about on this morning. And I came across this quote that's going to kind of frame what I'm speaking about this morning. It said that the first test of a true great man is his humility. And really great men understand that it's not about the greatness that they have on the inside, but it's about understanding that it's the greatness that comes through them. And what I mean by that, that it's not about what you have and what you've learned and what you possess, it's about the power of God working on the inside of you. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says that according to his divine power, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. And, when, and the reason that scripture is going to start our conversation this morning is because in life you don't know what to do. You have no idea, but God has promised you that I've given you everything for your life. And I don't know about you, but that's so encouraging because I didn't have a father in my home. I didn't have a father that was there leading and guiding me and directing me along the way. But I had a father that cares. I had men, I had the heavenly father that was giving me insight, the Holy Spirit. And so when we don't know what to do, we don't have the answers, when we tap into Jesus, he gives us everything we need for our families. Everything that we have that we don't possess, he gives it to us. So I really say that there's no excuses. There's no excuses. See, we make a lot of excuses. Well, I wasn't grown up this way. I wasn't raised. I have a father in my home. And we can come up with all these reasons. I, I had a bad dad. We can come up with all these reasons of why we neglect what our fa heavenly father has given us. But there's no more excuses. I couldn't make the excuse of, well, I didn't have an example in my home, so therefore I can be the worst father in the world because I wasn't trained right. No, that's not God. But as I grew in God, Lord, I thank you that what you've given me pertains to my life and my kids and my family and my wife. I'm, I thank you that you've given me what I need so that way I can be a ministry gift to them. I came to serve. Like Pastor Alex said earlier, we serve our families. See, we're serving them. That means that we got to grow up. I got to grow up. I got to, that Pastor Ken has said, I got to get my weight up when it comes with me developing as a man so that way I can properly lead them. See, but it takes humility. It's not about we thinking that we have all the answers. We know what to do. Don't tell me what to do, as the Elder Earl's mentioning. No, it's about, Lord, I think I'm so humbled that I need you to pour into me so I can pour into them. It, it's, 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 it's about me understanding that it's not what I think I know, or a man's supposed to be right all the time. No, we're making, as a husband and a wife, as a couple, we're making decisions together. See, it's not humility, it comes with uh, sometimes restraint. See, the society says, it's your way as a man on the highway, the, the wife is supposed to be following you. That ain't God. That ain't God. It's called a help meet. Come alongside. Let's figure this thing out together. It's not about this bravado that I do what I want to do and my family has the consequences of whatever decisions I make. That ain't God. 
Okay, let me keep going to my, my notes here. <laughs> See, that's the false pretense of society. That's not God's way. There's no male, no female, no Jew, no Greek, but there's equal partnership. So the fathers understand that what I have missing, God has given me in my wife to help my blind spots. Amen? Now, I took three questions. We polled a few Next Level men, and there are three responses that I selected that I'm going to help you um, in this, this next few minutes we have. And one of them was, how do I, or I'm going, I need to promote God and prayer with my kids at the youngest age possible. I heard that from, see, Next Level has such a wide range of men that some fathers are just having the five and the six and the seven-year-olds. And so they're like, I know that I came into God later in life. I don't want that same mistake. I need to invest God in them at the youngest age possible. And in Ephesians 6 and 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Oh, Lord, that was me. That was me. I provoked them to anger because I had bad examples of what a father was supposed to be. I was, I was insufficient in who I was. I was hurt in who I was. So, I, you know, you know that, that saying, hurt people hurt people? So I'm, 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 I'm throwing up on everybody. You know, you, you're one years old, you, you spilled the milk. I'm crazy. Why you spilled that milk? It was 10 cents worth of milk. But I was acting crazy like they killed somebody. So my treatment to them was I, I was immature. I didn't grow up. So I did not want to treat them or turn them to anger because of the way that I treat them, but rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So as I got mature in God, I learned to be more mature as a father. I learned to be more mature as a father. And the excuse couldn't be, well, I was raised that way, so it's good for you. That's not, that's not good. See we, see, we have some good things that we were raised at, some things that we need to forget about. You know what I'm talking about. There were some things that you were taught that was really good, but there are some things that we were taught that wasn't good, but yet we try to bring it into our families, and that's not God. The second thing, and the other Earl, you know, talked about this as well, but one of the things that I found valuable as a man is learning to apologize when you make the wrong decisions. Yes. Learning to apologize quickly. Yes. Apologize sincerely from a heart posture of, I messed up. See, it's not about, I'm a man, so I'm a father, so, you know, you just deal with it. That is not how it's supposed to be. And in James 5 and 16, it says, confess your faults one to another, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, and your sins. And the part that I love on top of that is, and pray, meaning fathers to their, their kids, so that there will be restoration and healing. See, when you acknowledge that you messed up, that I, I'm just completely wrong, there's no excuses. I'm wrong, I did not handle that right. I whipped you when I should have talked to you. I, I, I didn't honor you, I didn't, I didn't even give you a chance to even express yourself. You know, I grew up, shut up, don't say nothing. I don't wanna hear it. nothing you have to say, that's how I was raised. So that's how I fathered. You don't have no opinion. The opinion you have is the one I gave you. <laughs> That's just me. That's just people from Generate. That's how we do it, you know what I'm saying? We don't play that game. 
you don't have an opinion. You are a child. How dare you express yourself? Right? But no. So as I grew in God and as a father who loves my family, then those times that I slipped, fall, made a bad mistake, cost us money, cost us time, I had to acknowledge my failures. And, and, and thank God that there's grace there for healing and restoration. Because sometimes you can make so bad of a mistake that the relationship is severed big time. So I practice on my son. Veronica got it a little better. Joel got the, the best version of me as a father. I'm still happy that Michael still loves me, you know. <laughs> Amen. I tell you what, if he was my father and how I treated him, I don't know, man. Go, go man, get out, get my life. All that practicing on me. And my last one before Pastor Alex comes up is fathering a young adult. Because we have some fathers like Chris who has uh, a young adults as their children that's 21 and 25 years old. So we have such a wide age group that we have people on the other end of the spectrum that now, and I'm learning that, that I have to move from directing my children, Michael, to more reasoning. And that's hard. <laughs> the reason to consider can I make a suggestion? I, I was built like, you do this. That's my nature by default, is to do this. So I need a lot of prayer in tongues from the church. <laughs> I don't need any English. When you think about me, I need you to have that, that prayer of groaning. I'm learning, that's hard. And at Isaiah 1 and 18, in the King James Version, it says, come, let us reason together. And when I studied that, let us deliberate. Let us settle the, the matter. Let us come together in a sense of consensus, together. And see, I didn't have that attitude. My attitude has been, I'm directing you. But when you have a young adult that's 23 and 25 years old, you got to man up and say, I trained you as my first point as a young person, and now I have to depend on the Holy Spirit so that way when you make a mistake like you did, you know, I, I had this thing, I, I, I thought I came out like John the Baptist, speaking in tongues out the womb. I ain't made no mistakes, that's how my attitude was. No, so my children, I'm gonna allow them to flip and fall. I, I, I try to train them in the big things, please don't make these decisions, but let's reason together and let me honor their decisions. I'm here for you, and that's a big transition to allow your children to be them. Let's deliberate, let's come together, but I need to honor and respect them in their new young adult years. And that's hard. As a father, I'm questioning and I'm imploring you, do you have honor and respect and humility in your life enough to lean on God to give you everything that you need so you can be the best version to the family that he has given you? See, he didn't give you some other kids. He gave you those. And so if he's giving you those kids as gifts, what do I need to do to man up, to be a father to the gifts that God has given me? Amen? Amen. Well, uh, uh, let, uh, one second, I'm sorry. In true uh, prime time and next level fashion, they left the young person with one minute. <laughs> he pointed to him. <laughs> he over there following that paper. Um, 
If you are a father in the room, you know, you guys can come on, on the stage, everything. If you're a father in the room, can I get you to stand up really quickly? Father's in the room, if you could stand. And um, actually, won't y'all come up here to the front? I, um, I'm just going to share one thing, and, but we want to cover you guys in prayer as you go back out into the world. Um, 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Making kids does not grow us up. And it is very possible to have children and still be a child. It is up to us, especially as young fathers, to put away childish things. That's in how you speak. Your talk has to be different. That's in how you think. What you meditate on, what you allow to come into your mind has to be different. That's in how you reason, how you decide what you're going to do has to change. And oftentimes we are battling the very real issue of how do we be very present in the lives of our children while growing financially? How do I take care of my needs? How do I get us in a house? How do I get the cars? How do I pay for practice? How do I pay for school? How do I put clothes on their back? How do I put food on the table and be present? Growing and balancing is a large part of fatherhood in the beginning of the lives of our children. And along the way, while you're doing it, you realize that there are some undealt with feelings you have with your father. And as you spend time with your kids, it's maybe reminding you of the time that you didn't spend with your father. <laughs> So you're growing, you're balancing, and trying to overcome. But the encouragement is that we have a heavenly father. <laughs> and when we don't know what to say, how to be, how to show up, how to balance, how to speak, how to think, how to reason, God does. And our only responsibility becomes to surrender. Yeah. Surrendering our talk for his talk. Yes. Surrendering how we think for how he thinks. Surrendering how we reason how we decide, how we want to do for how the Lord has instructed us and guided us to do. And so we want to pray over you. And I'm hoping that what you've heard from our men on today has given you at least one thing to go home and meditate on. Just one thing. What is your one thing? I'm here to tell you that you are doing a good job. Yeah. I'm here to say that no one has it all figured out. No one. Because sometimes we think that at a certain point, it's just all going to click and I'm going to get it. Does it ever click? 
I don't even know what that was. Ah, that's all <laughs> lack of a click he has. He can't even say the words anymore. It's just <laughs> we're all doing the best we can with what we got. Come on. Be present. Yes, God. Don't go to sleep with anger in your heart. Develop a prayer life. Practice your spiritual authority. Walk around your home and get into a posture of declaration. Yes. Don't allow the enemy to continually feed you lies that you will not make it, that you are not fit, that your children won't respond, that they won't be there. Those are all lies. The truth is that the power of life and death is on your tongue. Yes. What are you declaring over your family? And then believe it. <laughs> believe it. What you declare over them, believe it. Have faith for it. Stand on his word for it. And you keep standing no matter how long it takes for it to rise out to the top for you to see. Amen. For those of you in the audience, you have a responsibility to the men that are on this altar right now. Because we are not doing a good job of encouraging, celebrating, and promoting the fathers who are here. And we hold the fathers that are here hostage to the mistakes of the ones that are not. I'm asking you in the audience to pray and ask the Lord to help you have words for the fathers in your life. And if necessary, this one is for everybody in the room. Forgive and let go. So we're going to cover you in prayer. We're going to thank the Lord for you. And then we're going to cheer for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these men. God, I declare that strength is pouring down over them from heaven. Lord, you are guiding, you are leading, you are directing, you are orchestrating, you're protecting them now. I declare, Father, that angels are encamped around each and every one of them. I declare, Father, that ministering angels are going directly to the need that they have right now. Whether it may be overcoming, navigating a blended family or dealing with having their kids in different homes. Whatever the obstacle may be, I declare, Father, that you are rushing in directly to the place of need, Father. And you're refreshing and restoring them, Lord. I pray that you allow them to experience the goodness that's found in you, Lord. Oh, Father, I declare that they are anointed. They are filled with your oil. <laughs> that you are directing them to use the power and the authority you've given them to raise up children for a time such as now, Father. Children who will search after God. Children that will be covered by the blood of the Lamb, Father. You're putting the wisdom and the strategy and the knowledge inside of these men right now, God. So, Father, we declare that no weapon, no weapon, 
no weapon, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon. No spiritual authority or principality in high places that is trying to war against these men will prosper. <laughs> that they are more than conquerors, Father. In you. In you. So we're not waiting for the world to say anything anymore. The church is declaring that these fathers are present. They are healthy. They are growing. They have balance. They have organization. They have joy. They have love. And they have hope. So, God, we declare these things over them right now, Father. Rain on them. Stir up the gift inside of them. Father, I declare that their life will never be the same, Lord. That you will begin giving them dreams and visions, Father. That they are going to go home and pray over their kids in a new way, Father. That you are expanding their authority, God. That you're growing their finances, Lord. You are growing their resources, Lord. They will never be the same. And we thank you for it on this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Can you stand up and give these fathers some love? Love right now, yeah. amen. 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 As you go out today, I challenge you. Tell your neighbor, I challenge you. Say, I challenge you. Come on, come on. Find somebody, say, I challenge you. Dap them up, say, I challenge you. Now look at me and say, What we challenging? Use your voice. Use your voice. Use your voice. Speak and declare over your family what God has showed you. If they are wise, tell them you're wise. Use your voice, and I promise you, you'll see the fruit. Thank you guys for being here. We pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you and causes his face to shine upon you. Happy Father's Day, man. Amen. Oh God, my God, I need you.